Black hair is the most amazing, versatile hair that there is. It's a mix of my mom and a mix of my dad. And that's what I love the most about my hair. I love my hair. I feel that my hair is a part of me. The black hair care market is a multi-billion dollar industry. And in America, although black people make up a third of the non-white population, they account for almost 90% of the spending in the ethnic hair market. But the stats don't reveal the full story. Throughout history, textured hair has been the target of great oppression, affecting black women's wealth and even their health. So what is the hidden cost of having black hair? Many black people have experienced some form of prejudice because of their hair. Every time you go to school with a new hairstyle, I would go in feeling great. But then you get all the kids wanting to touch it and put their sticky icky fingers in your hair. And it just became like tiresome. A co-worker came into my cubicle and proceeded to peck me. And it was probably the most uncomfortable experience I've ever had at, in a work setting. A survey by the Perception Institute asked black and white women to score their attitude towards different hair types out of five, with five being the most positive. It found that on average, white women regarded smooth hair as more beautiful, attractive and professional than textured hair. This attitude is something Tamara Jilkspor, The Economist's US policy correspondent, knows all too well. It has been considered unacceptable for black women to be able to present their hair in the way that it grows out of their head. And often that means having to do a lot of things to move their hair closer to Caucasian standards. So that might involve processing their hair with chemicals so it becomes straight, that might involve dyeing their hair, and that's really time consuming and really expensive. But the stigma against black hair runs deeper than just black versus white. There's a stigma also within the black community. The same survey found that black women also believed textured hair was perceived as less beautiful, attractive, and professional. From very early, you realize that your hair is either good or bad. And often it's compared to people close to you, like your mother or your sister. For African-American women, when their hair is closer to Caucasian beauty standards, they're often considered to have good hair. The concept of good hair began hundreds of years ago. In 14th, 15th century Africa, the hair was really, really important in proclaiming one's identity. You really wore a hairstyle that told the world who you were, what family you belonged to, what tribe you belonged to. The more elaborate your hairstyle meant the more status that you had. But the transatlantic slave traders shaved the heads of their captives, stripping them of their identity. For many enslaved people in the New World, their hair became a means of survival. Having good hair meant that your hair was kind of good enough to allow you to be seen as human instead of animalistic. The hair was one of the few things that could be manipulated. So if you could make your hair look less African and make it look more European, then you might actually not have your child ripped out of your arms. You may not be beaten as badly. You may not be given such backbreaking work that will kill you before your 30th birthday. So literally from birth, black mothers would try to straighten their children's hair, straighten their own hair, just to see if they would be seen with a little bit of humanity. Even after slavery was abolished, the pressures of black women to have more Eurocentric hair continued. If a black person wanted to find a job working with or amongst white people, then they were going to continue to try to copy their styles so that they could be, you know, easily assimilated into social society. All power to the people! But with the rise of the black power movement of the 1960s and 70s, natural textured hair became a political statement. To keep black hair looking like white hair, it's like, it's extra work, it's extra time, it's extra money. And so there was this faction of black people during the civil rights movement who said, you know what, I'm not even gonna do this anymore. But it didn't last. With a shift towards more conservative values in the Reagan era, fashion reverted back to more processed styles like the jerry curl. Fast forward to 2021 and black women still feel pressure to radically alter their hair. 
A study in 2019 found that African-American women were 80% more likely to feel they had to change their natural hairstyle to fit in at work. Many people spend a lot of time and money on their professional appearance. On top of all the other things, black women have this added layer of worrying about whether or not their hair blends in with what white society deems acceptable. Whether or not we need to straighten our hair to be appropriate for work, or whether we can wear braids, or whether we can wear our hair in our natural state. For braids, if I'm doing it myself, it, it takes anywhere between eight hours to 24 hours. I, I have to give myself pep talks. I have to really like build up the courage of getting my hair done. The days that I am doing a aloe vera pre-poo and then I go in and then I'll do a, a henna treatment or I'll do a onion juice treatment. They have to sit on my hair for like two hours. So this becomes like a whole day of hair. <laughs> it's not just time consuming but also expensive. A survey by Mintel found that almost half of black women in America use five or more hair care products at home. I've definitely come down a bit over the years, a lot, <laughs> because I could, I could say thousands. I've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. We've been led to believe as black women that black hair is complicated, you need like 500 different products, you need to do a seven step like wash day routine, but in reality it's not. The black hair business in total is estimated to be anywhere from four to nine billion dollars depending on who you ask. I mean you have stylists, you have the hair weave business is enormous, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. The product business, the shampoos, the conditioners, the creams, all of that. But often, these products are difficult to source from mainstream shops. 70% of British women of color feel the high street doesn't cater for them. Perhaps not helped by the fact that many of the biggest global hair care brands do not have a black woman on their board. It's a world away from the early years of the black hair care industry when it was dominated by entrepreneurs like Madam C.J. Walker. But then, decades later, you started to see that money go towards more white-owned or Asian-owned businesses. We're starting to see a bit of a turn now with women being able to sell their products online, but we're still seeing this disconnect between who's spending all the money and who's actually getting the money. Rachel Chumasi Corson and Joycelyn Mate are trying to disrupt the hair care market. In their office in London, they've created a brand to take on the hair giants. The problem when it comes to Afro and curly hair is that you can often end up with people that don't really understand how black hair works, but will make products just because it's lucrative. So many of these products are not being trialled on real people with real Afro hair as they're being made. They're being tested on chemically curled straight hair. So that means most of the products out there don't work that well, but it doesn't matter because the customers will keep buying it. And if they buy the first thing and it doesn't work, they'll buy the next thing, then the next thing, then the next thing. Frustrated by the lack of products on offer, Rachel and Joycelyn started their own hair care company. I was suffering from traction alopecia, which is uh, hair breakage. I just made a hair oil that I used myself, gave extra to Rachel. It was like, this is great, let's start a business together. We made 50 hair oils at the time, sold them in a trade show, and some of the people who had bought the oil emailed us saying they wanted more. And that's when we realised that there are more people like us who are looking for good products for Afro hair. In 2021, they raised $1.2 million in seed funding and now sell in 27 different countries. Their popularity has been helped by a growing awareness of perhaps the most serious side effect of processing textured hair the cost to women's health. When I was perming my hair when I was a preteen and a teenager, you kind of knew that it probably wasn't safe. It didn't smell very good. We had scabbing and burning. So you knew it probably wasn't good. But when I started doing research, it was so much worse than I realized. A study in 2019 by the National Institutes of Health found that African-American women who regularly used chemical hair straighteners were around 30% more likely to get breast cancer than white women. And it's not just occasional treatments like relaxers or perms that are toxic, but also products used on a daily basis. 
Epidemiologist Tamara James Todd researches the health effects of chemicals used in textured hair care products. You'll note on the label oftentimes the word fragrance. Well, fragrance is synonymous with hundreds of different types of chemicals. And one of the things that's holding that fragrance in there is a type of chemical called a phthalate. And phthalates have been found to be associated with adverse health outcomes. When these chemicals get inside of our bodies, they can really disrupt those normal processes. So they can impact reproductive health, cardiovascular health, and so on. Dr. James Todd's research found that half of the products being marketed to black women contain hormone-disrupting chemicals, and those were just the ones disclosed on the label. In America, it's not a requirement to safety test ingredients in personal care products before they are used. The European Union bans 1,300 chemicals from cosmetics, but America bans just 11. Here in the United States, we could do a better job by regulating um, the usage of these types of chemicals so that we could hopefully reduce risk. The growing awareness of these health risks has contributed to the rise of the natural hair movement. The natural hair movement that we are in the midst of right now is truly revolutionary because it is a movement founded on changing the notions of beauty for black women. When somebody says, wait a minute, your natural hair, the way it grows out of your head is appropriate for the workplace. It is gorgeous. You should love it. That is revolutionary. Between 2016 and 2018, sales of at-home relaxers dropped by almost a quarter as more women embraced their natural hair. Alongside this raised awareness of textured hair have come much needed changes in policy. Some states and cities in America have passed the Crown Act, banning hair discrimination. And there's a chance it may soon become federal law. In Britain, hair care companies are now being encouraged to support natural hairstyles. And since 2021, all trainee hairstylists have to learn how to cut textured hair but there is still much more that can be done. While the natural hair movement is empowering, it still has a long way to go before we are able to really truly be free in terms of our hair choices. There's a lot involved still, even with my natural hair, to get it to the texture and the shape and the definition that is considered acceptable for me to go to work. When we can get to a place where black women can also have a messy hair, don't care, whatever hairdo, and walk out the door and be okay, and be considered professional, then we would have made a lot of progress. It's important for all women to feel that they can arrive to the world the way that they are, naturally, and that when they do so, they're in full force. They're beautiful, they're confident, they're professional, they're everything they need to be, and more. You can read my piece on black hair by clicking on the link. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to subscribe.